Thank you for staying with us. This is Monday special. My name is Lillian Muli. Now, International Childhood Cancer Day is celebrated annually on the 15th of February to raise awareness and to express support for children and adolescents with cancer, survivors and their families. With access to quality care, more than 80% of children with cancer can survive living full and healthy lives. Now, according to International Agency for Research on Cancer, the reported worldwide incidence of childhood cancer is increasing. And the figures on your screen are statistics on the common childhood cancers in Kenya. And there you go. As you can see there, the leading is leukemia, and that is the most common type of cancer in the country, um, followed, of course, by what you can see on your screen there, which is um, written. And in that order, you can see lymphoma um, and, of course, the others that are listed there. Those are among the leading pediatric cancers in the country. We invite you to send in your questions and your comments using the hashtag MondaySpecialKE or you could SMS us using SMS number 22422. Remember the world will be observing International Childhood Cancer Day on the 15th of February. That's on Thursday this week and we want to create awareness around this rarely talked about topic. With me in studio this uh, evening, our guest is Dr. Jessie Githanga. She's a pathologist, a hematologist, and an associate professor at the University of Nairobi. She's got a passion uh, for childhood cancer. She has dealt extensively uh, with children um, living with cancer, and she's with us in studio. Thank you very much for being with us. We're also joined by Dr. Azaf Kinyanjui, who is Director of Programs at the Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Terry. And tonight, also with us in studio, we're joined by Brenda, um, who um, is, uh, of course, a survivor of childhood cancer. She's with us in studio and will be sharing a little bit of her story with us. Thank you very much for being with us. And we are also joined by her mother, um, who is um, Irene Okemwa, who will also be walking us through this journey for her as a parent, as you are well aware, uh, for the parents who have to deal uh, with their children being diagnosed as having cancer. It is quite a challenging time for them, and Irene and Brenda will be sharing their respective stories. Uh, many thanks for joining us, all of you. I'll start with you, Irene. When did you notice uh, that um, Brenda was not feeling well? Last year, March, mm -hmm. my daughter started uh, complaining of a uh, headache and uh, she was complaining that she has a, uh, she's weak. Whenever she comes from school, she was telling me, mom, I'm very exhausted. I want to sleep. I want to rest. When I ask her, you don't want to do the homework, she tells me, mom, do you just give me time because uh, I feel weak. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I did... I went to hospital where I talked to my doctor. Uh, what he did, he told me that he went to do some uh, examinations whereby he sent me for uh, for her to be taken a, what is it called? Mm -hmm. Okay, so your, your immediate cause of action was to take her to see yeah, a doctor, you yeah. didn't you didn't Indeed. administer any medicine to her whatsoever. Never, I never did that. And and she was complaining of being tired every single every day. Every single time, and uh, she was saying that she ha she has some uh, headache. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the, the moment I went to hospital. The doctor told me to go and uh, look for scan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and before I, I just get to the doctors as well, um, let me start let me talk to you brenda on on because mommy says you are feeling you, you you are coming home and saying that you're tired every day so walk us through exactly what you are feeling what were you feeling i was exhausted and i feel um, as if i i don't have enough blood and when i eat i vomit and I, I, when my mom took me took me to the hospital, first of all I fainted when I was at school, mm -hmm. and the teachers took took me to school and they found out that uh, I was sick anemia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did not. I, uh, I had lack of iron. Okay. Yeah. So so you are feeling you you are feeling very weak when you're in school. Yeah. How are your teachers responding when you would tell them that? 
um, you're not feeling well. I, I, sometimes teachers are caught up in, in marking exams and making sure that, that you guys fini finish your assignments. So in school, right at school, were, you, were your teachers aware that you were not feeling well? Yeah, they took me to the dormitory, they told me to sleep, and then they called my mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and I'll be coming back to mom very shortly. Dr. Terry, um, without creating alarm, we want to talk about some of the symptoms that parents uh, should not um, ignore when your child comes home and says, I'm feeling a certain way. Um, what are some of the symptoms that parents should look out for? Well, one that Brenda has told us very well is feeling weak. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that over time, this child is just getting weaker and weaker. Sometimes you may observe that the tongue as the child is talking looks whitish, not the usual pinkness of a tongue. Mm -hmm. Other things are swellings, swellings that don't go despite ordinary treatment like antibiotics, etc. Mm -hmm. And those swellings will persist. If it's a young child, maybe as the mother's washing, you may find that there's something hard in the stomach, and you may wonder, what is this hard thing? So anything that tells you your child is not right, and that doesn't get corrected even after simple treatments, mm -hmm. uh, should alert you that you need to go for further help elsewhere. Right. Um, coming back to you, Irene, you, you say that you went for further help. You, you actually sought the help of a doctor. Um, what next? What happened next? What, what happens after this, after you go see a doctor? When is the diagnosis made? And what is the diagnosis? Now, when the, we went for the CT scan and the results were out, uh, it was found that uh, she had a cloth in her nose. I, I thought that they were called uh, sinuses. Now, after they were removed, there are some flesh which were cut and they were taken for lump mm -hmm. for further examination. Mm -hmm. I was I was taught to wait for two weeks. Then I, I was called back to the hospital. When I went, they told me that my daughter is suffering from cancer. She has a, a cancer cell. I could not believe it, because I never thought of such can happen to me. But uh, because everything comes with God's uh, plans, I could not turn away from this, because I could not run away from my daughter. Mm -hmm. I could not take her to somebody else to, to be assisting her. So what I did, I prayed and I stood firm to be with my daughter. You reside within Nairobi. Um, where, which hospital did you go to? Uh, because this is, I think, uh, um, a question that's going to be coming in. Um, where did you go with the services of the oncologist um, that you sought? And indeed, the cost implication, um, what figures were being given to you right from the go? I don't reside uh, from Nairobi. Mm -hmm. I came from uh, a rural area called Mwingi. Mwingi is my home place, mm -hmm. and it is where I stay with my daughter. I, I went to Mwingi General Hospital, where I met uh, Dr. Mutune. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mutune is the one who went through the, the surgery for my daughter there at Mwingi, and is the one who made all this, mm -hmm. so that we can know that my daughter is suffering from uh, this disease. Right. I'll come to you, Brenda. Dr. Terry, when we talk about parents um, uh, such as Irene here who reside in rural areas, for her she was fortunate enough to get a doctor who was able um, to, 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 to find out exactly what it is that was going on. I'm thinking about a parent that's coming from, from a very rural area, very interior, who has to come all the way to Kenyatta National Hospital and then has to go through the process of treatment for their child and probably um, have to now wonder where they're going to stay for those months on end as chemotherapy is going on and what have you. Um, in terms of care uh, for patients, and I'm not talking about children, but for their parents, do we have those facilities currently in the country that can accommodate parents as such as Irene here when their children are going through such um, situations? Uh, thank you, Lydia, for that question. Unfortunately, uh, most of our patients have to travel for long distances in terms of seeking treatment. And the facilities which are equipped with those facilities 
don't have the supportive s structures in terms of like care for the guardians or the caregivers or the mothers. And most of the time you find these this, uh, parents or caregivers are forced to live in very an inhumane uh, status. Sometimes they are forced to sleep on corridors. Sometimes they are forced to share small costs with their children and such. But one of the things I know is that there is a project happening in Kenyatta where they want to set up uh, a hostel that will be able to take care of patients who are coming for chemotherapy or for radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. And that also should also be able to accommodate uh, parents who uh, have children getting radiotherapy or chemotherapy at the hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Dr. Terry, we know that um, in adults, uh, cancer is strongly linked to risk um, factors, lifestyle-related risk factors. For children, what are the known risks um, that could lead to developing childhood cancer? Mm -hmm. All right. And unlike the adults, things like diet, exercise, etc., alcohol, are not factors. Mm -hmm. Some of the risk factors are hereditary. There are some cancers, like a certain eye cancer, where about a third of patients will have a, a parent who had that eye cancer. So most of the hereditary, others are children who are born with hereditary disorders, um, such as like trisomy 21, or what we call Down syndrome those children who have Down syndrome are more likely to get cancer. Mm -hmm. um, others who have other hereditary conditions, there are quite a number, will be more likely to get cancer. Some of the factors such as um, previous treatment with anti-cancer drugs also can predispose one to cancer. Mm -hmm. And things like radiotherapy or radiation. Mm -hmm. There are studies in places to see um, because there are areas where there's higher radiation than normal. And it has been found that around those areas, children will develop cancer more than others. And that's why you see where there are a lot of these radiation masts, mm -hmm. people are advised not to live so close to them. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which comes to the question of how common uh, childhood cancers currently are in Kenya. Um, there is no known childhood cancer registry in the country mm -hmm. and therefore really the statistics that we're dealing with right now and those mm -hmm. that were on our mm -hmm. screens are those of 2015. There is no known cancer re registry which is a, a bit of a concern uh, for us as a country. Uh, in terms of how common um, this phenomenon is, would we say we're looking at an increase in cases? Are we looking at a manageable mm -hmm. um, situation? Yes, definitely the cancer rates in children are increasing. And even from the figures you saw, it didn't actually really closely reflect the commonest cancers that we see because lymphoma, that's the swellings uh, of the lymph glands, are actually the commonest type of cancer that we do see in Kenya. Mm -hmm. But so a lot of the figures we'll see are either from the Nairobi Cancer Registry, and because Nairobi and Kenyatta will receive a lot of referred patients, there it's the information may be skewed. And then there's the Eldoret, the uh, registry at uh, Eldoret. Mm -hmm. Again, that will give you skewed information on what's being seen there. Mm -hmm. And the two actually will be pretty different when you look at them. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the country, it's sort of patchy knowledge here and there. Right. So it is alarming that... Um, Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. that. Back to you, Irene. Um, we were going to get um, into the cost. You say you're from Wingi, yes, um, and yeah. therefore that is where you sought medical attention yeah. and help for your daughter. What, what were you looking at in terms of expenses um, that um, you were to incur um, during the treatment period of your daughter? Lillian, here I can say it is a lot of money. Yeah. I'm paying a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm parting with a lot of money because uh, uh, radiotherapy, I think it, it goes with uh, 10,000. 2,000. Uh, 2,000. Uh, chemotherapy goes with uh, uh, 10,000. Mm -hmm. And there is also these uh, examinations. When you go there, there they, they, they want to look at your blood, there, there, there are some uh, examinations for, uh, we, we, they, they check the, uh, the blood of the patient, mm -hmm. you pay 3,000. How often do you have to do this? How many times, say, monthly or weekly? No, for now, she's attending every day. Now she's taking radiotherapy every day and uh, chemotherapy once per week. Mm -hmm. So 
Even tomorrow I'll be in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is entirely at your expense. Do you have somebody that is assisting you with no. the funding? This? No. Mm -hmm. No. It's just me. And it is dangerous. Dr. Asaf, back to you. Are children in Kenya receiving appropriate treatment? We're looking at challenges um, such as those that um, Irene is talking about here, the expense. Um, so when you look at the expense and indeed um, how efficient our system is in dealing um, with cancer right at this early stage where we're talking about pediatric cancer, what's your assessment? Uh, as a country, we are still performing below the expectation because, as she said, the cost is unbearable to most of the health families in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the other challenge is also the, in terms of the infrastructure, where the service services are available. You realize uh, publicly, it's only Kenyatta National Hospital which is providing radiotherapy services. Apart from that, now the patients have to seek these services in private facilities, which most of the time the cost is very high. Mm -hmm. Again, most of our regional facilities don't even provide chemotherapy services because, again, there are few healthcare providers who have been equipped to provide uh, oncology services. So it's, it's, it's a myriad of issues, looking at the cost, looking at the expertise, looking at the infrastructure, and again also looking at the issues of awareness within the families, within the communities as such. One of the things we are um, happy at least that is the National Health Insurance Fund, NHIF, mm -hmm. has now come on board and uh, is supporting patients access radiotherapy or chemotherapy at a very subsidized rate. I know currently like Kenyatta, one session of radiotherapy is going for 3,600. And if the patient has an active NHIF card, mm -hmm. it will be able to cover the total cost of that service. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think is to encourage more patients to be alert for such initiatives. Right. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of a diagnosis, Dr. Jesse, um, when we talk about kicking out cancer and fighting it, um, how possible is this, uh, you know, looking at all the challenges we're looking at, such as the cost, mm -hmm. looking at distance for some parents who have to come from mm -hmm. far-flung areas. Yes, there is the diagnosis uh, factor, but in terms of effectively treating it and uh, totally getting rid of, of the cancer in the cells, um, how effective would, be, would this be um, looking at the myriad of challenges that a lot mm -hmm. of parents find mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. facing, particularly those who are, are unable to access some of these health mm -hmm. centers and are unable to afford um, these medical services? Yes, you, you stated it very clearly because for childhood cancer, early diagnosis is key. The earlier the diagnosis, the better the outcome. So as we've said, awareness is so important, but then having equitable access. By equitable, it means that it doesn't mean that only the children who are around the big treatment center like KNH, mm -hmm. but even the child in Garissa in a far flung place, it has the capability. Mm -hmm. And there are organizations now which have put um, cancer awareness, access to treatment as part of their a mandate mm -hmm. and we have the Kenya Cancer Organizations mm -hmm. that is working very hard with these awareness programs and with other organizations in order to try and get this message out to people. Mm -hmm. Which brings to mind whether we need to devolve cancer treatment facilities. If a parent uh, needs to travel all the way to Kenya International Hospital for instance mm -hmm. um, to, to get the, the needed medical mm -hmm. attention for their child and yet um, they are in a county that is very well able mm -hmm. um, to deal um, with a situation that arises where mm -hmm. a child has been diagnosed, for instance, with mm -hmm. cancer, even mm -hmm. if it is right here mm -hmm. in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that there is need to actually devolve these cancer treatment facilities? Mm -hmm. yes. Certainly, and moves are being done to do that because currently there are some children being treated in places like Kisumu, Jomo, um, uh, Jaramogi, Odinga, Odinga mm -hmm. Hospital, mm -hmm. and others in Eldoret. There are plans to build up Mombasa, but we really have to work hard because, as you heard, the specialists are very few, mm. and they need. And specialists in childhood cancer are not the same as in adult cancer. Mm -hmm. They are totally different. What is the difference? Yes, mm -hmm. many people think a child is just <coughs> a shrunken adult, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're twi quite different. Mm. A child has very different physiological mechanisms, mm -hmm. and the types of cancer we see in children are different from adult cancers. And that's why we said that childhood cancer is 80% of survival if properly treated right. as compared to adults, which may be just sort of, you know, quite different and quite uh, aggressive. But the childhood cancers have good, better outcome mm -hmm. 
and with specialists we don't only mean the people who give the chemotherapy or the radiotherapy we're talking about palliative care nurses we're talking about oncology nurses mm -hmm. and nursing is very key in, in, in cancer treatment we're talking of psychosocial aspects being looked at and radiotherapy and oncology surgeons mm -hmm. these are pediatric surgeons who are specialized in that yeah. so there's a whole host of specialists that we really need to build up and that's why we can't just say every center or mm -hmm. every county start treating mm -hmm. we have to be rational right. and say these are the centers where we can have and we can <laughs> have children or par and their parents referred and then they can have places they can stay at when they're not getting treatment mm -hmm. especially for those who are coming from very far right uh, Brenda back to you um, your experience um, <coughs> getting treated are the nurses being kind to you are the doctors being kind to you do they explain to you um, what the treatment is all about and how you're likely to feel after this re after after receiving this treatment how are they treating you they are they are kind yeah mm -hmm. and they love me mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. always encourage me and tell me that soon you'll be okay yeah yeah Okay, and uh, this experience uh, for you um, as, as a little girl, you told me you're 11 years old. Yeah. Um, are, you, are you frightened? How are you feeling about this whole experience? I don't feel anything, mm -hmm. yeah. You're being a strong girl for mommy. Yeah. And that's mm. good. Uh, let's let's, let's uh, come to you, Dr. Azaf. Um, in Kenyatta National Hospital, for instance, the figures we have right now is that at any one time in the world, there are over 100 children with cancer, the, the, fac the facilities are simply not sufficient enough to cater for um, all the numbers um, that they have there. So they end up lumping children such as um, Brenda here together with other children who are suffering from other diseases. Yes. Um, in terms of um, the facilities that we currently have in the country, earlier we spoke about parents not really being housed appropriately when they have to bring their children uh, to these cancer treatment facilities. What's your observa observation in terms of the, and I'm not talking about Kenyatta National Hospital only, I'm talking about other centers uh, as well mm. that simply do not have the capacity to deal with the numbers. Um, what, what has been your observation um, in the recent years? Um, it's it's, it's, it's still a uh, work in progress, but uh, we are still, uh, as I said, as a country, we are, not, uh, we are still performing poorly. Because you'll find, uh, like even in Kenyatta, sometimes these children are also composed, uh, are housed in the same ward where you have children with other infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. And we know very well their immunity is so, so they are prone to infections like TB or any other form of infection. So you'll find that uh, even in most of the public facilities, they don't have those special facilities where these children can be isolated so that they can get the optimal care they, they require. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, as we said, si since it's working in progress, one of the things we, we are hoping is that we'll have joint efforts between county governments. And instead of each county setting up an oncology unit, it's regional counties coming together to form our, our, our oncology unit, which is fully equipped. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things we are trying to urge our county governments to work closely with the national government to do that. Yeah. So that at least we have functional units. Because once you have a small county having one oncology unit, most likely they will not be able to meet the basic requirements. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But one of the things I also urge is the citizens to put more pressure on the government to allocate more resources to add cancer. Because if you look at uh, like the current government, issues of infrastructures are highly rated. But you find healthcare is just maybe number three or number four in terms of government priority. So I think as citizens, we need to push for more resources so that at least we have more services in place, and especially at the county level. Right. Yeah. Uh, Irene, um, the progress of Brenda um, currently, what, is, what are the doctors saying? Yep, uh, Lillian, uh, with the doctors, they are telling me that my daughter will be okay soon. Mm -hmm. After she's uh, uh, through with this uh, medication, they have told me she will be okay, mm -hmm. yeah, and she will be back to school. Okay. Yeah. So this this has taken how long for you? This um, since you you she was diagnosed um, to now. Um, how long has it been? I started uh, uh, her treatment last year on uh, February. It uh, went. It I started with the uh, chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. We did it uh, for six uh, sessions. Then, uh, and these facilities are all available at Mwingi? 
No. Mm -hmm. Where are you having this treatment done? At uh, Texas. Oh, Texas. Yeah. At the cancer I center. was sent. I was sent to Texas. So you're commuting Nyonges. from from Wingi, and are you now currently living in Nairobi? No. Mm -hmm. Here at Nairobi, I have a, le a relative mm -hmm. I receive from a place. Okay. She stays at Kawa West, mm -hmm. so I'm spending a lot. Mm -hmm. In the morning, I pay, both of us, we usually pay 600 to and fro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from uh, Texas to Nairobi uh, to Kawa West mm -hmm. every day. Right, and for that parent who is watching, um, who perhaps has just uh, received a diagnosis um, that might be similar or maybe different, um, to your child, um, just looking at, I mean, just going back to, 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 to where you've come from since she was diagnosed and the trips to the Texas Cancer Center up to now, what, what were the side effects for her during the treatment period? What, was she, what has she been going through? Okay. Uh, the first time she, her hair went out uh, because we, uh, the first session, second, it 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 went <laughs> it disappeared yeah. that 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 chemo, mm -hmm. but uh, after we we were through on uh, on on October, mm -hmm. we stayed two months. Now she has another hair. Wow! Yeah, yeah. And um, when we came back on uh, January, Doctor mm -hmm. Nyongesa and um, advised me to come back because we were to send another test mm -hmm. somewhere else a secondary she told me that one is called secondary mm -hmm. when it was sent i was told that sh I, she has to be done now the what she is being done the radiotherapy together with the chemo mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah uh, and i don't think you've really given us um what type of cancer it is that the doctors are treating do you have a specific yes uh, yeah what is it Lipoma. Okay. Yeah. Which is what Dr. Tari here was talking yes. about. Okay, so just give us a little bit um, of information around lymphoma um, and basically the treatment um, that her mother here is talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, chances of, of, of effectively treating this lymphoma uh, in terms of other previous case studies. Um, what are we looking at? What scenario are we looking at? Okay. First of all, lymphoma is actually a group of diseases and there are several types. The common type that we see in Kenya is called bucket lymphoma where it causes a swelling of the jaw. Mm -hmm. um, we see it very much in relation to the malarial area so there's a quite a big peak in western parts of Kenya and the coastal regions of Kenya. Grows very fast mm -hmm. but has quite good outcomes with proper treatment. Right. Then there's another one known as Hodgkin lymphoma and then hers, which may be a different type of lymphoma. Mm -hmm. So in childhood, the lymphomas have good outcomes and they will be treated with what is known as chemotherapy, that's the drugs, and also with radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. Now the radiotherapy often may be, especially if it is affecting somewhere where it may affect the brain or, or in the skull, etc. Mm -hmm. So they will treat that. Or if it is Hodgkin's with the, you know, with the swellings, you'll get chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. But for something like bucket, you'll only get chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So each depends upon the type of cell yeah. that is affected mm -hmm. and how sensitive it is to the type of treatment. And the treatment that Irene is talking about here seems quite aggressive mm -hmm. for a child. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at a, an 11 year old really, uh, when you talk about um, the aggressive nature of this chemotherapy and the radiotherapy, mm -hmm. is it as aggressive as it would be for an adult? Yes, it's pretty aggressive. And in fact, childhood tumors are treated very aggressively and many adult mm -hmm. tumors are borrowing from those because with cancer, you want to be aggressive, as aggressive as you can get to get rid of the tumor because it can come back mm -hmm. if you're not as aggressive mm -hmm. as you can get. Yes. And this now brings in the issues of survivorship because mm -hmm. now children who survive and adults who survive cancer, they also need that care mm. post-treatment because those treatments are pretty toxic as you heard her mother said the hair came off, mm. you know, and there'll be other side effects, so, you know. Uh, talking about treatment of children, 
um, are children being treated in the appropriate way in this country? Because um, there's likely to be trauma around this whole experience, like Dr. Aria is talking about, um, like, um, you know, Brenda's mom told us here, um, the child losing her hair, not really understanding why she's not in school anymore. Um, are we treating children in a, in, 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 in a more, uh, these, these are little children, are they being handled more carefully or or more appropriately um, than is necessary, or are we in a situation where um, they're just being handled in terms of, you know, fighting the disease and then uh, hoping that they will um, reintegrate into society as if nothing ever happened? Mm. Uh, previously, what happened is that, uh, as Professor Kivanga said, this, we used to look at uh, children as just a small adults, and how I'll handle an adult is the same as the two children. But there is a movement in terms of uh, from the palliative care pas aspect, looking at the patient from a holistic perspective. You look at the child in terms of their physical body, you look at the child in terms of their mind, you look at the child in terms of their uh, spiritual aspect. And also now also bringing in the community on board. This includes the family, includes the friends and such, so that if a child like Brenda is admitted in hospital, mm -hmm. once in a while we need also to allow the friends to come mm -hmm. and visit us, so that there is an element of interaction with the peers. There's also an element now we are moving towards even looking at the community surrounding that child, mm -hmm. be it school, be it the churches and such, so that at least the child feels that their life doesn't stop, despite that they are receiving the oncology care. But it's, it's a journey which we have to keep on emphasizing, we have to keep on advocating so that children can be able to be treated as children and be allowed to uh, behave as, as such. I want to take your feedback very shortly, but before that, Brenda, um, what questions do you ask mommy about this whole experience, and who do you talk to when you have a question um, surrounding your treatment? Do you have some things that, 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 that confuse you, that you'd like a little bit of clarification on? What are some of the questions that mommy has answered or your doctors have answered that you've asked them? Uh, uh, um, last week I asked my doctor uh, if uh, when I finish my medication, if I would be okay and I would go back back to school because I have missed school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What class were, are you in? Class six. You're in class six. Yeah. What did the doctor say? He to, uh, the doctor told me you'll be all right and you'll go back to school. You learn like the others. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and that's true. Yeah. And let's take your feedback now as we uh, begin to wrap up our conversation. Remember, our hashtag is Monday Special KE. You could SMS us using double two four double two. Mm -hmm, there we go. And this is um, okay. We're going to get your other feedback. That was not so clear. We're taking it uh, very shortly. Um, in terms of filling the gaps, uh, Dr. Um, Jesse, in terms of what Kenya is doing to fill the gaps, there's a lot of uh, challenges surrounding um, cancer in children, including the fact that it is not as talked about as adult cancer mm -hmm. is. Um, and therefore, as the world, once again, as the world observes International Childhood Cancer Day, this Thursday, we ask you to come out to support the cause um, to um, fight cancer in children, as well as adults as well, but specifically for children uh, this Thursday, fundraising events, visiting the children that are in cancer wards across the country. It goes a long way um, in kicking out cancer from our society. But in terms of Kenya uh, filling the gaps currently, what is currently being done? Well, the ministry now has a national cancer control program, and we're very happy to see that for every aspect of the control program, right the way from awareness, diagnosis, treatment, etc., there is an aspect that is touching on specifically on childhood cancer, mm -hmm. which is new because before the childhood cancers just were not there. Yeah. And we are happy about that. And each time now they're trying to include. We also have those um, civil organizations mm -hmm. And there's some which are actively included or actively working on childhood cancer. Some of like uh, Hope for Cancer Kids, etc., yes. which helps get NHIF payments mm -hmm. to parents who are cannot afford and they have children with cancer. Mm -hmm. Kenya Childhood Cancer Trust right. and many other organizations. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a start in the right direction, but we really need a push, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to move to the next step. 
Right. Yeah. Irene, do you have an NHIF um, cover? Do you have an NHIF card? Has it been of any help to you during this process? Uh, the first time it helped me, but this time when I came back, they told me it is not working at uh, Texas, mm -hmm. so I'm paying cash. Okay. Yes. Let's take your feedback once again as we uh, get um, your winding comments. And there we go. Kakai Kwa Kulabusia, you're saying it's painful. Cancer is the second killer disease um, after infectious diseases, yet the government is doing so little on oncological scientific research. We need serious uh, gene mapping for all Kenyans. Thank you for that. This is Irene Tomanka. Very informative topic on pediatric cancer. Very scary looking at the statistics. Marco Witte, you're saying these children are in many occasions given wrong therapy. Cases referred overseas always begin with detoxing for wrong medicine. Uh, Mwangi, you're saying a good talk to create awareness and do away with stigma in patients, more so parents whose kids are already diagnosed. Keep strong, Irene, in the cancer fight. And Terry Kinyanjui, thank you for airing this topic. Many people, especially from the villages, do not know about childhood cancer. It's time to create awareness. Somebody talked about stigma, um, Irene. Did you encounter any were there any people that um because you're from wingy right yes, yes. um so <coughs> that's that's uh, pretty much rural um, yeah, it is a rural place. unless you live in the urban area but yes. what was the reaction to your relatives your friends or um your in-laws if if at all you have any yeah, yeah. um learning about um this diagnosis yeah they were very amazed and uh, scared also mm -hmm. you know uh, at a place like my place there people don't understand that such a thing can happen to a young child mm -hmm. so they thought maybe there is a another <laughs> thing which has yeah. been done to my daughter mm -hmm. but for myself because uh, I'm born again I could not listen their voices yeah. I knew anything can happen and uh, sickness is with with us mm -hmm. yeah um, do you have other children at home? Not really. Okay. I have only Brenda. You only have Brenda. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, j back to you. Somebody there, there's a viewer there who talked about misdiagnosis and the fact that some parents actually just go to pharmacies. The, the minute your child says they're not feeling well, your first reaction is uh, to Google or to self-medicate. Mm. Um, and therefore, you know, the dangers uh, that lie therein, just as a word of caution to parents who are in the habit of, if your child has repeatedly been telling you she or he is feeling a certain way, what to do? What is the immediate reaction? What should be your immediate reaction to that? Yes, uh, as Dr. Rivanga mentioned that childhood cancer is easily treatable mm -hmm. if detected early. And one of the things we need to emphasize is that once you notice your child is not feeling well, they keep on complaining of maybe fever which is not resolving, they have lost weight, mm -hmm. uh, they're feeling tiredness like Brenda. Uh, you take them to a proper hospital, a well-established facility, so that at least they can be able to get professional advice. Mm -hmm. In most of the instances, you'll find the reason why we are getting late diagnosis, and especially in children, is because one, the parents uh, believe in other traditional practices. Mm -hmm. So they will first take maybe the child to a traditional healer, and by the time they are coming to a hospital, it's already too late. Sometimes they also come to our facilities, but the healthcare workers they sometimes interact with are not properly equipped to be able to pick the, the signs and symptoms of cancer. Mm -hmm. So again, if you take your child to a facility for one, for two or three times, and they keep on complaining that they, those symptoms are persistent, mm -hmm. then it's, I think it's high chance that, that you refer that patient to a specialized facility so that they can be able to get the proper attention. Uh, the third is also that uh, we need to regulate, even in terms of access to some of these medications, because again, as one of the viewers said, some of those patients, when they come to us, they already have a lot of toxins mm -hmm. in their systems mm -hmm. because of the issues of self-medications, because of issues of herbalist medications. Right. So even sometimes we receive patients who we pretty could be managed, but sometimes their kidneys are already damaged because of the herbal medications they are taking mm -hmm. back at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we need to create awareness around those issues. On the same, Dr. Mm -hmm. On the same. Yes. Um, we have to have proper diagnostic tests mm -hmm. because as you heard for Brenda the diagnosis involved taking a bit of tissue and looking at it mm -hmm. sometimes not just looking at the microscope other tests need to be done mm -hmm. to find the exact type of cancer it is so 
those are expensive. And these are areas that we need to advocate that NHIF can pay for the diagnosis mm -hmm. because the proper diagnosis is the first step yeah. mm -hmm. to the cure. Mm -hmm. So that's one area that we advocate, mm -hmm. you know, plus you who is very keen on this mm -hmm. need to, to, to work on. Um, so getting the proper diagnosis is very key. Okay. And then getting, as, as the Daktari has said, all the other steps in place, mm -hmm. access to the treatment. They waste a lot of time going from a health center right then to another center, then to another center. And each time you're being referred, time is being wasted. Mm -hmm. The money is getting depleted. So from the first instance when a patient thinks this one has cancer, the patient should be referred to a center that can handle all those. Right. Not you go for a little bit here, a little mm -hmm. bit there, mm -hmm. and then a lot of time has Therefore expired. consistency. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to you, just as we close now, because we're closing, had you ever had such an experience within the family have you known of a family member that has been diagnosed with cancer previously um, even from um, your in-laws side mm. it came to my side my biological dad died on uh, March last year mm -hmm. she had uh, a tumor mm -hmm. and uh, before b before we came to realize the doctor had not uh, told us what uh, my dad was suffering. We thought it is a normal tumor which can be treated because she had a, she had a sukari. What do you call it? Di she was diabetic mm -hmm. and uh, she, she had both diabetic and she had a tumor. Mm -hmm. Now the last minute, it is the time we were told the tumor is cancerous mm -hmm. and uh, is gone. Okay. Mm. So just your parting remarks, your closing remarks um, as we end Monday's special tonight. This experience for you as a parent, for a parent who is perhaps going through the same thing or has just had their child diagnosed with cancer, what would you like to say to them? What have you learned out of this entire experience in terms of medical care in this country around cancer and also in terms of you as a parent and how parents should relate to their children in such times? Yeah, Lillian, which I can uh, say to the viewers, I can tell them when a, a, a situation comes like this one, uh, it, it is on my side, you have to admit and get strong and be on your, uh, your child's side. Mm -hmm. In every time, in every moment you are a daughter or you are a child, let me put it a child, eh? tells you she has a problem or she needs this, you should be there for her or him. Because nobody else who can, uh, who can be there be for, for, be, be for, for her. Yeah. Uh, unless you stand firm and pray God, this thing is hard, yeah. Lillian, if I can say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is very hard. Because even the diet, I'm telling you, it is but a tell hard us a thing. little bit about the diet. Yeah, when it comes to diet, mm -hmm. Uh, you have to check uh, a lot to the vegetables mm -hmm. and a lot of fruits. Yeah, you feed a lot of fruits and uh, a lot of vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the child. How is your appetite? How is your appetite? Is it For now, it has gone down because she has mouth sores. Okay. Yeah, but I'm working That's because on of the treatment. Yeah, because mm -hmm. of the treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. And uh, we're closing. Now I'm mashing food for her. Okay, you're mashing food for her. And uh, yeah, let me let you finish, then I can let her finish as well. Yeah, you were saying? Yeah, I'm saying mm -hmm. a situation like this, it is hard for a parent because uh, you'll find you have to stop your duties first to get out the duties for the daughter. For now, it is very expensive, if I can say, because uh, if I can account what a uh, at, at Nairobi area here, to get the fruits, you have to sweat because mm. they are very expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I can say, Lillian, if I can sa get somebody who can assist me, it is good to be frank. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate mm -hmm. and thank God for it. And I'm sure our viewers have heard that. Um, to you, Irene. Yes. Where are the Brenda? Um, I know your friends in school are watching. I know they miss you. Uh, I know other girls who are perhaps in the cancer ward maybe will watch this show later. 
What do you want to say to your friends and to other little girls or little boys who are going through cancer treatment today? What do you want to tell them? I would like to tell them they should not worry. They encourage themselves and their parents mm -hmm. should encourage them. And, and they be strong. They stand firm, yeah. That's all. Okay. Yeah. And we're so proud of you for your strength. We wish you a quick recovery. Thank, Thank you very much for being on Citizen TV. Will you come to visit us again? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll be here <laughs> waiting for you. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, that's Monday special. And we were joined this evening by Dr. Jesse Githanga. She is on this end. She's a pathologist, hematologist, and associate professor at the University of Nairobi. We're also joined by Dr. Asaf Kenyanjui, director of programs at the Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care. And also tonight we're joined by Brenda Okemwa, this brave little 11-year-old.